My talk is entitled The Imaging for Acute Stroke Basics of Acquisition and Interpretation. My topics for discussion today are as follows. I'm going to talk about the aims of first-line imaging in stroke. I'm going to compare CT versus MRI imaging in stroke. We're going to look at some imaging, these imaging features and how to interpret them. And then finally, we're going to look at the impact of imaging on treatment decisions. Where possible, I will relate relevant imaging features to the European Stroke Organization or ESO guidelines. So first to the aims of first-line imaging in stroke. It is often said that stroke is a clinical diagnosis. So imaging is used to determine the underlying cause of stroke symptoms. All three of these patients may present to hospital in the same way. The problem is we cannot clinically differentiate ischemic stroke on the left from hemorrhagic stroke in the middle from stroke mimics, in this case, tumor on the right. The treatment for each is very different and getting it wrong could be harmful, even fatal for the patient. Brain imaging needs to be available immediately, performed and interpreted rapidly so that appropriate treatment can be determined. In other words, we're trying to identify patients eligible for thrombolysis and or thrombectomy. Urgent brain imaging is required for all patients who present with symptoms of stroke. Time is brain. According to Jeff Saver, for every minute of an ischemic stroke, 2 million neurons, 14 billion synapses, and 12 kilometers of myelinated fibers are destroyed. These familiar graphics show us how the likelihood of benefit after both thrombolysis on the left and thrombectomy on the right drops with time elapsed after ischemic stroke onset. Note that the peripheral lines showing the 95% confidence intervals for treatment effect on the odds of a good outcome cross the line of no effect, the horizontal line, around five hours for thrombolysis on the left and around seven hours for thrombectomy on the right. Thus, the European stroke guidelines indicate that under normal circumstances and barring major exclusions, thrombolysis can be offered up to four and a half hours from stroke onset and thrombectomy up to six hours from stroke onset. Now we will consider the CT and MRI features of stroke and how to interpret them. Whole brain volumetric CT imaging takes only seconds to acquire, about the same length of time it takes to scroll through this image stack and can be viewed in any plane as you can see here. When we review CT features for ischemic stroke, we may see nothing in the very earliest stages. Up to one hour after stroke onset, there is usually only cytotoxic edema with no net shift in water volume and thus no visible change in brain on CT. Then over the next few hours with the development of ionic edema, there is a net gain in excess water causing a drop in the CT attenuation of brain and early swelling. These features can be subtle, but are best appreciated as a loss of gray-white matter differentiation, often seen as an apparent loss of cortex and or basal ganglia. Swelling is usually minimal. In case you haven't yet seen the early changes on this slide, here they are. Late ischemia on CT in comparison is usually easily visible with marked drop in tissue attenuation seen as darker areas and advanced swelling. These features are secondary to vasogenic edema, a more rapidly progressive state with large net water gains in the brain. This is an unfortunate case of what we call malignant MCA infarction, since without surgical intervention to release the pressure of swelling, the patient is likely to die. The hyperattenuating or hyperdense artery sign is a highly specific and moderately sensitive marker of arterial obstruction. If present, it is visible soon after onset and is more reliably identified than subtle brain changes. High specificity means that if the sign is present, we can be confident there is a true arterial obstruction, as demonstrated here with concurrent angiography. Moderate sensitivity means that if the sign is not present, present we cannot be confident whether there is an arterial obstruction. It's about 50-50, so half of all arterial obstructions found in CTA are not visible on CT in this way. Stroke caused by hemorrhage is usually more easily seen in the earliest stages. Note the dense or hyperattenuating blood on these images. There are three common non-traumatic causes of spontaneous bleeding into the brain. Uncontrolled hypertension, typically causing bleeding into the deeper structures of the brain, such as the basal ganglia, as in the top left image, or into the brainstem. And two, amyloid angiopathy, typically causing bleeding into the lobes of the brain with finger-like extensions of blood into the gyri and commonly extending into the CSF-filled sulci around the brain, as in the top right image. And three, 
when there is an underlying vascular abnormality, such as an arteriovenous malformation shown in the bottom row here, ruptured aneurysms can also be considered here. CT angiography, or CTA, is used in stroke to provide an unambiguous evidence of large artery obstruction, particularly for patients being considered for thrombectomy. In this context, CTA also provides a roadmap of the neck vessels used during thrombectomy to access the intracranial arterial blockage. Note that most CTA, as shown here, provides only a snapshot of the arteries for a single moment in time. Collateral circulation is better assessed using multi-phase CTA to appreciate delayed filling. MR brain imaging for stroke commonly includes these six standard sequences to identify ischemic brain changes, hemorrhage and arterial obstruction. Since each imaging sequence must be acquired independently, the whole process can take over 10 minutes. Some centers use more focused stroke protocols to reduce time. On MRI, ischemia appears bright on T2-based sequences as seen in the top row here. These appearances do not appear immediately. Like CT, they rely on a net water increase and only become visible after a few hours. Comparatively, DWI or diffusion weighted imaging and its ADC counterpart seen in the bottom row are sensitive for the cytotoxic edema, which is, if you remember, that very airless change that we see before there is any net gain in water. Therefore, DWI abnormalities are clearly visible in the first few minutes after ischemic stroke onset. Much like the dense artery seen on CT, MRI can also provide indirect evidence of arterial obstruction with the loss of normal arterial flow voids. This is possible since moving blood does not normally return any signal and appears black, whereas stationary blood clot re does return signal and looks more like other tissues. Note the lack of the left internal carotid artery flow void on the right side of this picture. This obstruction was then confirmed with MR angiography. Similarly, heme-sensitive MRI sequences, such as this SWI on the left, may clearly highlight arterial blood clots. MR angiography, or MRA, can be used like CDA to provide direct evidence of arterial obstruction, but is more sensitive to imaging artifacts, such as apparent occlusion if flow is actually reversed, in this case of subclavian steel on the left, sorry, wrong slide, and movement artifacts on the right pair of images if injectable contrast is, is used, is not used. So this is the subclavian steel case, and this is the uh, angio without contrast and with contrast in the same page. Heme is slightly magnetic, so hemorrhage sensitive sequences on MRI will take advantage of this property to provide imaging which is highly sensitive for the presence of blood products. In addition to the large acute frontal lobe hemorrhage in this case, Note the many chronic microhemorrhages in the right side of the MR image in a patient with amyloid angiopathy that are not visible on CT. Therefore, MRI is especially useful for patients with stroke when we need to identify hyperacute changes that are not yet visible or are too small to be easily seen on CT, and when we wish to determine whether there are microhemorrhages to support a diagnosis of amyloid angiopathy. Here is a summary of the main differences between CT and MRI for the acute assessment of stroke. Reading this helped us understand why CT is predominantly used for first-line imaging in stroke. It's cheap and regularly available in most hospitals worldwide, especially 24-7. It's fast, which is better for confused or disorientated patients. Now we will consider the impact of these imaging features on treatment decisions for stroke using the best evidence we have from randomized control trials or RCTs. The next few slides include forest plots, which combine and summarize data between different trials or from subgroups within trials to explore the impact of various imaging features on the effectiveness of treatment. In all cases, data points to the right of the vertical line support the use of a given treatment. In other words, these analyses can help us to understand whether specific imaging features should be used to decide whether or not to treat patients. This forest plot includes a meta-analysis of four thrombolysis RCTs that measured the size of ischemic lesions using aspects. Note there is no difference in the overall effect, the diamonds, for patients with small ischemic lesions, that's aspects eight to 10, compared to those with larger lesions, aspects zero to seven although the group with the larger lesions is slightly underpowered. These data suggest that all patients, regardless of lesion size as assessed using aspects, can benefit from treatment with intravenous alteplase. However, 
The lack of certainty for the group with larger lesions, which is replicated in similar analyses using greater than one third MCA territory involvement as the measure of extent, leads to a cautious recommendation from the ESO. The European Stroke Organization recommends considering IV alteplase for patients under four and a half hours from stroke onset with more extensive visible early ischemic lesions. Clinicians are encouraged to balance this against other imaging and clinical features in favor or against treatment, and therefore to treat only selected patients. For example, to include time since symptom onset, extent of white matter lesions, and pre-stroke disability in their considerations. Similarly, this forest plot includes a patient level meta-analysis, i.e. all the data are combined into one data set of the seven Hermes thrombectomy RCTs. Again, we are comparing aspect subgroups. Notice that there is no significant difference between subgroups based on lesion size for thrombectomy. In other words, there is not strong evidence to support excluding thrombectomy on the basis of lesion size alone. However, the, sub the subgroup with the largest lesions is again underpowered. Note the wider confidence intervals for those with aspect zero to four. Here, the ESO recommends that patients with larger ischemic lesions and aspects less than six are recruited into a dedicated RCT, which will hopefully allow us to definitively answer the question. However, again, they concede that treatment may be considered on an individual bas basis after considering other variables such as age and time since stroke onset. In a similar analysis using data from one thrombolysis RCT to assess the potential impact of visible dense arteries on alteplase response, we see no significant difference in outcome between patients with and without a dense artery. Although again, we acknowledge that the subgroup with a dense artery is underpowered. Nevertheless, this approach is compatible with ESO guidelines, which states that there is no good evidence to avoid thrombolysis for patients with known arterial obstruction. The wake up trial was, a, was an RCT comparing IV alteplase versus control for patients who had an unknown time of symptom onset. They used a mismatch in the visibility of ischemic lesions on two different MRI sequences, DWI and FLAIR as shown here, to determine eligibility, since this pattern of mismatch suggests that stroke onset is under four and a half hours. Remember that DWI is sensitive to the very early cytotoxic form of edema, whereas other two T2 sequences like FLAIR are not. The wake-up trials struggled to recruit patients since many did not have the required imaging mismatch and had to be stopped early due to limits on funding. Nevertheless, the researchers were able to identify a significant difference in three-month outcome favoring IV alteplase. In other words, for patients who wake with symptoms of ischemic stroke or otherwise have an unknown time of symptom onset, the presence of a diffusion flare mismatch on MRI can be used to determine eligibility for alteplase. Thus, ESO recommends IV alteplase in this context. So just to round up, my conclusions are, CT is widely used for the rapid first line imaging of stroke, where it is really important to minimize delays. We should add CTA if thrombectomy is available. MRI is best for problem solving. And finally, there is limited randomized control trial evidence that imaging features of ischemia at baseline should be used to deny patients treatments for stroke.